Chapter 9. Relational Hunger in the Modern World The Maori elder walked us to a gate at the bottom of a gentle sloping hill. At the top of the hill was a beautiful rectangular building with amazing carvings on its pillars and beams. The gate led into the Marae, an enclosed area that is the center of Maori community life. The building was the community meeting house, or Faranui. Several dozen members of the Maori community lined the path up to the meeting house. One of the elders approached us holding a club and loudly speaking Maori, then placed a frond on the ground in front of me. An elder woman started to sing. Others joined in. Our welcoming ceremony, the Paufiri, had started. Twenty-five years ago, Dr. Robin Fancourt, a pioneer of pediatrics in New Zealand, asked me to come visit and teach about my work on developmental trauma in the brain. In return, I had asked if she could help arrange time with some Maori healers. I had been trying to understand more about the healing practices of indigenous peoples. Trauma has always been part of the human journey, and our ancestors knew trauma well. I'd spent some time listening to and learning from elders and healers from First Nations, Métis, and Native American communities. I'd seen common elements of healing practices, most prominently the use of rhythm and an emphasis on harmony with nature. I knew, though, that there was much more to understand. For the next two days, I was going to learn about trauma and healing through the lens of a Maori community. My first lesson was about education. The elders didn't have me sit and read or give me a presentation about traditional healing. They immersed me in community for two days. In their wisdom, they were gifting me a learning opportunity, an experience. What I could discover was profound, but what I would discover was on me. Would I let myself be open enough to truly learn, or would I simply filter the experiences through my Western medicine lens and regard it as a quaint anthropological footnote? For the rest of the first day and night, the community came together on the marae. We gathered in the meeting house, sat on the floor. Many talked with me about traditional ways. Very quickly, it was clear that they made no conceptual separation of problems or solutions into categories like education, mental health, juvenile justice, or child welfare. There was a wholeness to their ways of thinking and being. This was remarkably similar to the worldview that Cree and Métis elders had shared with me. There was also a true appreciation of our journey to this moment, an awareness that in order to best understand the here and now, we need to know where we come from and what happened to us and our ancestors. When someone spoke to the group, they went to a corner where everyone could see them, and they could see everyone. The speaker introduced themselves by tracing their family lineages, frequently noting an ancestor's special attribute. This explicit tracing of ancestral heritage brought a continuous appreciation of cross-generational connections. Then they would speak, often using storytelling to make a key point. Throughout the two days, there were communal meals. These were a mix of ceremony, conversation, games, storytelling, all with lots of laughing and hugging. It had the feeling of a family reunion. The warmth and strength of the community were palpable. At night, we all slept in the Faranui, together, as a community. On both days, I had the honor of being guided onto the land and walking the forest and beach with two of the elder healers. At times they would stop, walk off the path to a plant, and break off a leaf or some bark, or dig for a root. They would have me smell and taste, telling me about the potential uses. Make a paste with seawater. This helps with pain. The elders were very patient with my curiosity, and gently amused at my Western medical model formulations of disease when I asked how they handled depression sleep problems, drug abuse, and trauma. They kept trying to help me understand that these problems were all basically the same thing. The problems were all interconnected. 
In Western psychiatry, we like to separate them, but that misses the true essence of the problem. We are chasing symptoms, not healing people. For my Maori hosts, pain, distress, and dysfunction would arise from some form of fragmentation, disconnection, and dyssynchrony. We talked extensively about these issues. The Maori people, like all colonized people of the world, have been impacted greatly by historical trauma. The transgenerational fallout of colonization, cultural genocide, and racism has been devastating. Rates of unemployment, poverty, alcoholism, domestic violence, mental health and physical health problems are much higher among the Maori than in the general population of New Zealand, which is 85% white. Similar overrepresentation of indigenous people and people of color in special education, mental health, juvenile justice, and criminal justice systems is seen in Australia with Aboriginal and Torres Strait people, Canada with the First Nations, and the United States with Black, Latinx, and Native American populations. The Maori concept of disease explained these differences better than my medical model did. Colonization intentionally fragments families, community cohesion, and cultures. And that disconnection is at the heart of trauma. A core element of all of the traditional healing practices was something the Maori called Fanangatanga. The word refers to reciprocal relationships, kinship, and a sense of family connection. From shared experiences and challenges, a sense of connectedness and belonging emerges. Many of the healing practices and rituals involve reconnection, explicit articulation of the origins of connection. This involves sharing experiences such as a hunt or raid, and then symbolically and literally reconnecting to family, community, and the natural world. The elders were always clear that they were not rejecting advances in genetics, immunology, or physiology, and they partnered closely with the Western-trained physicians working in their community. But they felt that a view of health that granulated the complexity of a person into component parts, treated by the bone doctor, eye doctor, brain doctor, and so on, was simply missing the core elements of health. If connectedness, Fanangatanga, wasn't addressed, the potential effectiveness of Western interventions was blunted. As my visit was coming to an end, I stood next to the elder on a bluff overlooking the ocean. Wind was blowing off from the water. Waves were crashing against the rocks. The effect was loud, overpowering, and rhythmic. I thanked the elder for spending so much time with me. She turned to me and smiled. She put her palm over my heart and said, We are healers. At the time, fueled by my Western physician ego, I thought she meant that she and I were healers. Now I understand that she was trying to tell me, once again, that the collective we of a community heals. We are all healers. When I returned from New Zealand, I was determined to better understand the relational health of the children I worked with. I was curious to see if we could find evidence of the correlations between health and connectedness. The first step was recognizing that I hadn't really been asking about some of the most important aspects of the children's lives. How do they spend their time all day? Who were their friends? Their people? Where did they feel safe? And what had happened along the way that resulted in their being sent to see a psychiatrist? I had been too focused on what was wrong with them, what problems, symptoms, failures in school we needed to address. Our standard assessments measured the nature and severity of their symptoms. We didn't measure the nature and quality of their relationships. Our approach to treatment wasn't getting to the heart of healing. Fananga Tanga. Timothy, a 10-year-old boy, was one of the first patients I talked with after coming back from New Zealand. We'd been seeing him in our clinic for about nine months. He'd been referred by a local pediatrician after being involved in several angry outbursts and aggressive behavior with a classmate. He'd been given a diagnosis of ADHD and Oppositional Defiant Disorder, ODD. The medications prescribed to treat his disorders had not improved his symptoms, hence the referral to our clinic. 
When I looked back at his records, I saw many clues to his current problems. Starting at age three, Timothy had been physically abused by his mother's live-in partner. They lived with this violence and abuse for about three years, until his mother left the abusive partner, at which point they were immediately plunged into poverty. His mom struggled to find a decent job. Over the next three years, they moved to three different cities, resulting in three new schools for Timothy, three new neighborhoods, and sets of neighbors. Finally, after they moved to Texas, his mom got steady work. Slowly, they started to regain some economic and social stability. But their experiences had taken a serious toll on both of them. The mother was worn out and worn down, depressed but functioning, barely. Timothy had classic trauma-related symptoms. Hypervigilance mislabeled as ADHD, sleep issues, exhaustion from the sleep issues, and his continuously overactive stress response. And then there was the social immaturity. Despite being 10 years old, Timothy had grown up with few opportunities for social practice. The combination of always being the new kid and having a trauma-related inefficiency in learning led to a significant delay in his socio-emotional development. He was like a five-year-old in a ten-year-old social world. He was ignored or teased. He was excluded. He felt most regulated when he was alone or with his mom. He wanted to fit in with other people, but he didn't have the skills. When they first moved to Texas, he'd made friends with a six-year-old on his block, but this boy's parents were uncomfortable with the age difference and discouraged then forbade any significant play together. At the clinic, Timothy and I sat at a table together, in parallel, drawing and coloring. You know, I realized that I never asked you about your friends, I ventured. He kept coloring, didn't say a word, almost as if he hadn't heard me, but I know he was using an avoidant response. Who is your best friend? Without hesitation, he said, Raymond is my best friend. I don't remember you talking about Raymond. He is really nice. We went swimming together and caught some frogs. He likes ninja turtles like me. Though he was usually somewhat withdrawn and sad-looking, Timothy was animated and enthusiastic now. Are you guys in the same class? He stopped, seemed to be thinking. I, I don't know. I didn't ask. I was confused. Does he go to your school? No, he lives in Kansas. Ah. How often do you guys get together? Just last summer. Maybe I'll see him next summer when we go camping again, he said wistfully, returning to his sad baseline. I felt sad as well. Here was a child telling me his best friend was someone he'd met once at a campground and played with for a few days. This boy had no friends, really. His extended family lived in a different city. He wasn't part of a community of faith. He was a single child, and he was marginalized within the school because of his immature and impulsive behaviors. He was viewed as an odd child. His mother worked so hard, struggling all alone to care for him. When I saw her, she always looked sad herself. The contrast between their world and the Maori community was striking. The Maori had such rich relational density and developmental diversity. Babies, children, youth, adults, and elderly all in the same space. Moving, singing, talking, eating, laughing. I imagined Timothy running around the Marae with other children, episodically engaging with aunties, uncles, and grandparents. Or camping again and chasing frogs with his friend Raymond. It made me smile. Then, more realistically, I pictured him searching the school cafeteria for a safe place to sit alone at lunch, walking home from school to an empty apartment, waiting for his tired, loving mother to come home, filling the time with video games and TV. Trauma had impacted both Timothy and his mother. They were both experiencing poverty of relationships. They had no therapeutic web of positive relationships, the relationships needed for healing. Timothy and his mother needed connection. They needed Fananga Tanga. Over the next weeks, we met with Timothy and his mother several times and changed our treatment approach. First, we enrolled the mother in our clinic. 
As surprising as it sounds, few clinics for children also serve adults. Considering the frequency of transgenerational and intrafamily trauma, this is a powerful example of the destructive fragmentation of our siloed systems. We found Timothy an in-school mentor, signed him up for an after-school program with the Boys and Girls Club in his neighborhood, and stopped all his medications. We encouraged his mom to check out a local church's group for single parents. She'd grown up as a Presbyterian, but hadn't really found a church home in Texas. We met with several of Timothy's teachers as part of an individual educational plan. After learning what lay beneath his behaviors, the teachers were much more understanding, and one took a special interest in him. Timothy had been invisible, and the teachers were all overextended. But now he was seen by more people at school. Six months later, Timothy was thriving. He had no more behavior problems at school, and he'd made up a full year of academic content. He had a new best friend, someone he played with every week. He was active in school, after school, and in his new community of faith. His mom was also doing better. She found the single parent group very helpful and was forming new friendships. She had been heartbroken by Timothy's struggles, so his progress was a tonic for her. And the natural contagion of a happier parent only fed his progress. Positive reciprocal relationships and a new sense of belonging helped heal this small family. And it was just the beginning of my exploration of the power of connectedness. Dr. Perry. You've said that our world is relationally impoverished. We live in environments where we see fewer people, and even when we do see people and engage in conversation, we're not really listening to each other, being fully present. And this disconnection is making us more vulnerable. I think that's true. Even though we live in an amazing country filled with good people, I believe that collectively we're less resilient. Our ability as a people to tolerate stressors is diminishing because our connectedness is diminishing. This relational poverty means less buffering capacity when we do experience stress, and we are becoming more sensitized to anything that feels potentially threatening, such as a person with a different political opinion. Many people are overly reactive to relatively minor challenges, and when we're overly sensitive, due to state-dependent functioning, we quickly shift to a less rational, more emotional style of thinking and acting. We're losing the ability to calmly consider someone else's opinion, reflect, and attempt to see things from their point of view. I see that all the time. Someone makes one mistake or something they said a long time ago resurfaces and cancel culture takes over. No one wants to listen to each other. And the irony is that all human communication is characterized by moments of miscommunication and getting out of sync, but then repairing things. As my good friend Ed Tronick, a pioneer in developmental psychology, teaches us, interpersonal rupture and repair is good for building resilience. These ruptures are perfect doses of moderate, controllable stress. Conversation, for example, promotes resilience. Discussions and arguments over family dinners and mildly heated conversations with friends are, as long as there is repair, resilience-building and empathy-growing experiences. We shouldn't be walking away from a conversation in a rage. We should regulate ourselves, repair the ruptures, reconnect, and grow. When you walk away, everybody loses. We all need to get better at listening, regulating, reflecting. This requires the capacity to forgive, to be patient. Mature human interactions involve efforts to understand people who are different from you. But if we don't have family meals, don't go out with friends for long, in-person conversations, and communicate only via text or Twitter, then we can't create that positive, healthy, back-and-forth pattern of human connection. Pleasant, positive moments are wonderful, of course, but what you're saying is... That true growth comes from tougher moments, more difficult conversations, and we need to approach these moments with an awareness of what happened to you. Exactly. Empathy is the ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, both in an emotional sense, to feel a bit of what they may feel, but also in a cognitive sense, to see the situation from their perspective. 
If you approach an interaction from an empathic stance, you're much less likely to have a negative perspective on whatever is going on. And hopefully, that will allow you to get to know the person better, even if it's someone you already know. Hopefully, you get to know more of their story. And this, in turn, lets you be a bit more regulated in the way you interact with them. When somebody's being rude, our typical response is to get caught up in the contagion of their emotions. We get dysregulated, and then we mirror their rude behaviors. But if you can approach the interaction from a regulated, empathic stance, your response changes. And that changes everything. You've also said that the human brain is really not designed for the modern world. Let's talk about that. Well, human beings have been human beings in this genetic form for about 250,000 years. And for 99.9% .9 of that time, we lived in hunter-gatherer bands of relatively small multifamily groups. So our brain is suited for the social attributes and complexities of these smaller groups. Through almost the entirety of our existence as humans, our social network was small. We only knew 60 to 100 people. We may have had some connection to other bands with similar kinship ties and some common cultural elements, but mostly our world was small and embedded in the natural world. We had more developmental diversity, adults, youth, and children mixing in the same spaces throughout the day. There was more physical proximity, more touch, more connectedness. The daily rhythms, colors, light, and sounds of the natural world are what our sensory systems evolved to monitor, as well as the verbal and even more so nonverbal cues of our relatively small but complex social groups, our clans and tribes. But today we live very differently than we did thousands of years ago. We have invented our modern world. And whenever this world and its inventions start to stretch us away from our genetic capabilities and preferences, we run into problems. Our current challenge is that the rate of invention is now exceeding the rate at which we can problem solve. In the last 2,000 years, the rate of change in our world, in our demographics, technology, transportation, and so forth, has exploded. As the writer and biochemist Isaac Asimov said, the saddest aspect of life right now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. Part of the challenge of inventing ourselves away from the natural world and our social preferences is that doing so stresses the neural systems involved in monitoring the world. Our stress response systems are drained by constantly monitoring the sensory cacophony of the modern world. Street sounds, traffic, airplanes, radios, TVs, the hum of refrigerators, the hiss of computer fans. Living in an urban environment taxes these systems even more. Every time you see someone new on the street, your brain asks, safe and familiar, friend or foe, trustworthy or not, over and over and over again. You scan the attributes of each person and compare them to your internal catalog of safe and familiar. This constant monitoring of the social environment can consume a significant portion of our bandwidth. At the same time, we're in rebellion against nature. We use artificial light to stay awake at night. The foods we eat are extremely processed, profoundly different from the foods that our body evolved to digest. All of this stresses our body, especially the brain. And the stress is far worse if you have to also worry about housing, food, or unemployment. The unpredictability and insecurities of poverty drain the stress response system's bandwidth in ways that make opportunities to escape poverty extremely difficult to take advantage of. We've talked about how poverty can induce trauma, but as you're pointing out, it's not just economic poverty that we have to worry about. Isolation and loneliness are an epidemic, especially during the pandemic. Exactly. I'm very concerned about poverty relationships in modern society. In our work, we find that the best predictor of your current mental health is your current relational health or connectedness. This connectedness is fueled by two things. The basic capabilities you've developed to form and maintain relationships, and the relational opportunities you have in your family, neighborhood, school, and so forth. Simply put, modern life provides fewer opportunities for relational interactions. In a multifamily, multi-generational environment, 
the continuous social interactions provide a rich source of regulation, reward, and learning. And that's how we used to live. In 1790, 63% of our nation's households had five or more people. Only 10% had two or fewer. Today, those numbers have basically flipped. In 2006, only 8% of households had five or more people. 60% had two or fewer. In a recent survey of selected urban communities in the U.S., Europe, and Japan, up to 60% of all households were just one person. Add to this the impact of screen time. At home, at work, at school, we spend hours and hours in front of a screen on average over 11 hours a day. We are having far fewer family meals. Our conversational skills are fading. The art of storytelling and the capacity to listen are on the decline. The result is a more self-absorbed, more anxious, more depressed, and less resilient population. Do you think all of this adds up to less empathy? Well, the capacity to demonstrate empathy is a function of key neural networks in the brain. And these networks are organized on a use-dependent basis. In other words, just as language fluency requires exposure to lots of conversation and verbal stimulation, empathic fluency requires sufficient repetition with caring relational interactions. And our modern world is not providing these opportunities for our children. In extreme situations, if an infant does not get consistent, safe, stable, and nurturing care, the crucial capacity to form and maintain healthy relationships won't develop. And depending upon a host of other developmental experiences, a range of problems with intimacy, social skills, and interpersonal behavior can develop. You've worked with people who never developed the ability to empathize. Right. I remember sitting in prison interviewing a woman who had murdered a young mother so she could take this mother's infant and raise it as her own. As I reviewed her records and talked with her, her disconnection was painfully clear. But when you learn what happened to her, it made sense. She herself had been abandoned when she was six days old. She then spent a few months in shelter care, where she had multiple caregivers before entering the foster care system. So from birth, she had no relational permanence whatsoever. She didn't belong to anyone. She didn't belong anywhere. By the time she was 16, she had lived in seven states, in 12 cities, at 26 different addresses. She never went to the same school for two years in a row. The longest she lived in any single place was eight months. She had no connection to family, to community, to place. This woman was remorseless, expressing no real feeling for the mother she killed or the infant she took. As we talked, she felt empty and cold. She was lacking in empathy. But as we discussed in Chapter 3, you can't give what you don't get. If no one ever spoke to you, you can't speak. If you have never been loved, you can't be loving. But aside from extreme cases like hers, you've said there's been a shift in our collective ability to be empathetic, to feel one another's pain. Exactly. I'm talking about undeveloped or immature empathy. When young children hear fewer words, they can still learn to speak. They'll just be less fluent. In the same way, when children have fewer relational interactions, they'll still develop social capabilities. They'll just be less mature, more self-centered, more self-absorbed. This is what several studies are showing. There's been a significant drift in measures of empathy. The typical college-age adult is 30% less empathic and more self-absorbed than 20 years ago. One study documented a 40% increase in psychopathology in American college students over the last 30 years. The authors suggest that this is related to, quote, cultural shifts towards extrinsic goals, such as materialism and status, and away from intrinsic goals, such as community, meaning in life, and affiliation, end of quote. This is not to say that young people are bad or worse, but it's a clear example of how our life experiences shape us. What happens to you matters, and we all reflect to some degree the relational attributes of our family, community, and culture. 
When I think about the changes in our family structure, in our culture, I often think of the Barry Levinson film Avalon. The opening scene is a large, multi-generational family gathering at Thanksgiving. The apartment is relatively small, but all the generations are there in their loving, noisy chaos. Cut to the final scene. On a later Thanksgiving, after, quote, making it and moving to the suburbs, a nuclear family, once part of the big family, is sitting in parallel, not talking, eating frozen dinners on tray tables, and watching TV. Our society's transgenerational social fabric is fraying. We're disconnecting. I think that's making us more vulnerable to adversity, and I think it's a significant factor in the increases in anxiety, suicide, and depression we are seeing currently, even before the COVID-19 pandemic. You think that's about disconnection? Yes. Disconnection and loneliness in our society are playing a major role in the increased anxiety, sleep problems, substance use, and depression we're seeing. A recent study by a team at Harvard found that of all the factors involved in depression, the most powerful were related to connectedness. Quote, The protective effects of social connection were present even for individuals who were at higher risk for depression as a result of genetic vulnerability or early life trauma. Certainly, our work supports that observation. One of our major findings is that in determining someone's current mental health, the history of their childhood relational health, their connectedness, is as important as, if not more important than, their history of adversity. And for children and youth experiencing trauma, the best predictor of their current mental health functioning is their current connectedness. I'm reminded of the Maori elders and their belief that trauma, anxiety, depression, and substance abuse are all the same thing, and all related to our connectedness our sense of belonging. I agree. I mentioned that. One profound thing I realized after listening to thousands of people share their stories is that all pain is the same. We just choose different ways to express it. And beyond that, I believe we're all here to learn from one another's pain. So the loss of community and the social isolation we all feel is a source of great collective pain. Exactly. Disconnection is disease. I think the Maori elders were right and that there is some correlation between rising suicide rates and the increased fraying of our social fabric. We are now raising our children and youth in environments that are both relationally impoverished and sensory overloading from the proliferation of screen-based technologies. We're all too attached to our phones. No one even makes eye contact. Right. There's more texting, tweeting, and posting, but less actual conversation. I believe we don't have enough quiet conversational moments listening to a friend with no other distractions. That kind of interaction leads to a completely different quality of human connection, a different depth. I think we crave that, and many of us turn to social media to find it, but ultimately those interactions don't satisfy the craving. Meanwhile, rates of suicide, anxiety, and depression are rising in our youth. We think of our culture as so advanced, and we have such wealth, creativity, and productivity, yet the disparities and inequities in all of our systems continue to marginalize, fragment, and undermine community and cultural cohesion. We may have a pretty good public education system. We may have amazing technologies, but we're still not meeting the fundamental relational needs of our children or ourselves. So many people feel empty and are seeking connection, and often seeking it in really unhealthy ways. And it happens at all socioeconomic levels. Wealth doesn't seem to stop anyone from having anxiety or depression. True. But being on the bottom of any power differential makes life a lot harder. If you don't belong to the in-group, your marginalization can contribute to feelings of not belonging. As we talked about earlier, the brain is continually scanning the social environment for signals that tell you if you do or don't belong. When a person gets the signals, many of which are subconscious, that they belong, their stress response systems quiet down, telling them they're safe. They feel regulated and rewarded. But when they get cues that they don't belong, their stress response systems are activated. And don't belong cues are our default response to anyone we don't know, especially if they don't have the attributes of our familiar group. We view this person as a potential threat. As 
the other. That's right. Now think about the implications of that for our modern world. As we mentioned, if you live in an urban area, you may see hundreds of new people every day, and your brain has to continually monitor these hundreds of people. Friend or foe, help me or hurt me. It is taxing. It consumes emotional bandwidth. Often people living in urban settings learn to completely ignore and disengage with others. They may walk past you without any acknowledgement. The interaction makes you feel invisible, but for them it might just be a form of self-preservation. Many people have had the experience of feeling exhausted after a day of travel, even if all they did was stand in a few lines and sit on a plane. This happens because your brain was continuously monitoring thousands of new stimuli. Remember, activating your stress response systems, even at a moderate level, for long periods of time is physically and emotionally exhausting. So, part of the increase in anxiety in our modern world comes down to the constant bombardment of novelty, especially social novelty, and the absence of counterbalancing relational connection. So, as our world expands and we encounter more and more people, the brain becomes overwhelmed. Exactly. And as a result, it will start to use shortcuts to manage all of these new people. Your brain can manage only a limited number of fully reciprocal relationships. Interestingly, in light of what we've been talking about, this number is about 80 to 100 people, the size of a large hunter-gatherer band. It takes a lot of energy and time to get to know someone new, and there's only so much space in our brains. Maybe this is why moving is so hard. Right. When you're new to a community, having moved away from what's familiar, your brain is going to be continually trying to manage all the novelty. And that's very hard to do without any real relational anchors in the new environment. The relationships will grow, but it takes time. This is why people are most vulnerable in the first six months after major transitions, after leaving the safe, stable, and known behind to start building a new set of connections. Think of the girls at your school. They are incredible young women, but they've been taken out of their social context and put into a completely new environment. Until they can rebuild that connectedness, there's a vulnerability. That's why I try to find them host families so they always have a place to go, a safe space. And that's a really smart thing to do, because connectedness is what helps us manage transitions and regulate in the face of nonstop bombardment of novelty. And now, without community... What do people do? They look to their devices. There's nothing objectively wrong with it, but in the end, it's a hollow connection. Exactly. I sometimes see an almost frenetic attempt to be connected by getting more friends or followers or likes. There's such a powerful pull to belong, to make your clan. But as you say, social media connections are often hollow. Because it's not the friends or followers who stay by your side when you're sick or when you get divorced or just feel lonely. They're not sitting at the table with their neighbors or even in many cases with their families. I'm thinking back to what you said earlier, that disconnection is disease. Could isolation be categorized as a new form of trauma? Well, I do think that in some situations, isolation and loneliness can create sensitization of the stress response systems. So in that way, they can be traumatic. For example putting someone in solitary confinement. The timing of the isolation also makes a difference. Think of the woman I met with in prison who'd been abandoned as a newborn. I think it would certainly be reasonable to consider relational poverty, lack of connectedness, as an adversity. Poverty of relationship can disrupt normal development, influence how the brain works, put you at risk for physical and mental health problems. It's absolutely not good for you. Especially for children. Yes. We all want to be part of a group, yet so many children are marginalized, excluded, or bullied. This can be devastating. Being left out can have a deep and enduring impact. In many ways, the result of our society's poverty of relationships is a form of social and emotional starvation. Our children are starving. I think that's a difficult concept for most people to get because children in our modern culture seem to have everything. What do you mean when you say they're starving? Well, there are different forms of nourishment. 
One of the things we don't appreciate in Western cultures is how powerful and important touch is to our physical and emotional growth. Touch is as essential for healthy physical and emotional development as calories and vitamins. If infants aren't held or rocked, if they don't experience the loving warmth of a caregiver's touch, they won't grow. In fact, they can die. Literally die? Absolutely. And many people in our society, including children and youth, are touch-starved. Healthy touch is not well understood. We actually have schools where tiny toddlers whose impulse is to run up and hug a classmate or teacher are told not to touch. In return, the teachers and other caregivers are not allowed to touch the children. But it's simply unhealthy for a three- or four-year-old child to go eight hours without touching or hugging or playfully wrestling with another person. That's one of the things that so disturbed me when I heard about parents being separated from their children at the Mexico-U.S. border. Colleen Kraft, the former head of the American Academy of Pediatrics, said what struck her was that the caretakers weren't allowed to touch the toddlers. The babies are screaming and crying, and the caretakers have been told that they're not allowed to touch them. They just kept giving them toys and giving them toys and giving them toys. I know there's a way to allow healthy touch while protecting children from unwanted touch. Absolutely there is. This is a classic example of making policy recommendations with good intentions but minimal understanding of the developmental needs of children. The intent is to help children by minimizing the potential for inappropriate touch or abuse and at the same time, protect staff from any false allegations. But rather than thinking through reasonable options to ensure healthy touch in a well-monitored setting, blanket no-touch rules are applied. This is a common thread in our culture. We're reactive. We prioritize convenient, short-term solutions. We're risk-averse. And we use material things rather than relationships as rewards. Here, have a toy. Be good and we'll give you a thing. Giving toys instead of calming touch is an outrageously misguided practice. It's the result of developmentally ignorant, trauma-uninformed policies and another example of the need to change our systems. When I heard that, it made me cry. We really need to do better. We, we know better. We know that human contact is healthy. We know that too much time in front of a screen cannot replace a friend teacher, coach, or parent. And again, the speed with which we're inventing our world is outpacing our ability to understand the impact of our inventions. Television, video games, phones, computers, these are all pretty new. And we don't quite know the full impact of these devices on the developing brain, on how our children will think and process experience. But we're beginning to understand the disruptive impact that 11 hours in front of a screen can have on social development. We've all seen the disruptive effect of text messages or phone calls during a family dinner or a conversation with friends. And the distracting impact of surfing the internet during a lecture in school or a meeting at work. I've heard you use the phrase techno-hygiene. I love that. Will you explain what it means? Basically, I believe we need to develop social practice rules about when and how to use our new technologies. We've always invented new rules as we've created new technologies. Take current hygiene practices, for example. In the history of medicine, one of the most important advances was recognizing the relationships among disease, microbes, and sewage. It seems unbelievable to us now, but surgeons used to go into surgery without washing their hands. People went to the bathroom wherever they wanted, and communities dumped sewage into drinking water sources. But as we learned about bacteria, infection, and disease, we realized we needed to manage things better. A host of hygiene protocols developed. We socialized children to go to the bathroom in the bathroom. We wash our hands after using the toilet. We keep our sewage away from our drinking water. I think we need the same sort of universal rules for the standard use of our technologies. No phone zones and no phone times. Proper dosing and spacing of screen time and so forth. We know, for example, that nonstop screen time for a young child is not optimal for healthy development of language skills, attention, or concentration. So age and time limit recommendations have been made by the American Academy of Pediatrics. As we learn more, we can develop and modify some of these hygiene recommendations. 
Isn't it true that children who are under the age of two or three should not even be looking at a tablet or screen because it's bad for the development of the brain? It's probably not optimal. Why is that? Well, our brain is organized in a way that makes us visually biased. Though we have multiple senses, vision tends to be the dominant one. Images can evoke powerful responses because our brain has a preference for colorful and moving visual content. When you combine those two things on a screen, the viewer's attention is captured. That's not necessarily bad until it becomes so pleasing and engaging to the brain that we begin to prefer it to other less stimulating, less busy sensory input. An infant or toddler consumed by a screen is missing out on other critical forms of learning about the world. They should be exploring what things feel like, smell like, taste like. They should be making sense of their world using all their sensory tools. You know how babies and toddlers are always putting things in their mouth? They're trying to see what a purple flower tastes like. They are making sense of the world. But if 75% of your day is spent staring at a screen, not touching, feeling, moving, or interacting with other human beings, you're essentially underdeveloping key parts of the brain that are rapidly organizing at that time of life. The best way to teach a child language isn't to put them in front of a screen. It's to talk with them. When you actually look at children's language acquisition, you see that fluency is related to the number of words spoken in a back-and-forth, interactive, conversational way, not the number of words heard on a device. And we want children to make real-life connections with other children and adults. As you said, the empathy systems in the brain develop when there are many opportunities for stimulation. So, ideally, if a child is growing up in a relationally wealthy home with lots of opportunities for safe, stable, and nurturing interactions, they will be building their connectedness and resilience. This insight was a core understanding of all the traditional child-rearing and healing practices I learned about from indigenous elders. Their understanding of the primacy of human connectedness reflects a wisdom lost in our current world. How ironic that the cultures our modern world has marginalized are the very cultures with the wisdom to heal our modern woes.